let me introduce David McLeod. He's a senior environmental specialist um, with the Environment Energy Division in the City of Toronto. David's been uh, with the City of Toronto staff policy and research lead on the issue of climate change and extreme weather risk management since 2007. I met David years ago because I was working with uh, Environment Canada at that time and we worked together and, and uh, Toronto was a way ahead of the wave when it came to putting climate change plans together, uh, et cetera, and addressing the problem. He provides leadership and engagement of various city-owned and non-city-owned infrastructure sectors in climate change risk assessment and management. His work involves understanding infrastructure system interdependencies and risks of cascade failure in such areas as roads, railways, telecommunications, electricity, and food supply chains. David is actively involved with the C40 network of cities working to combat climate change. Among his peers from other climate progressive cities around the world, and there are progressive cities around the world trying to take on a leadership role, he is considered an international thought leader in the areas of infrastructure system interdependencies and climate risk disclosure. Prior to joining the city for 17 years, David was an environmental management consultant and certified environmental auditor for over a dozen industry sectors across Canada and the Northeast USA. Some of this work took place in northern or rural parts of Canada. David has taught courses at the university master's level in environmental management systems and urban climate adaptation. He holds an MA in environmental studies from the University of Toronto and a BSc in geography from Carleton University. Join with me to welcome David McLeod. Thanks, Don. Oh, you don't want to trip, though. That was a good catch. Uh, delight to be here. And uh, thanks so much, Joss, for the invitation. And thanks, Don, for the kind uh, introduction. And actually, uh, you know, when Don and I worked together, uh, he was a great supporter. Uh, and we did get some good stuff started there uh, when he was working for the federal government. Uh, so today I'm here uh, as a near south neighbor and I'm here to learn and maybe share some thoughts uh, that might be helpful based on some of the experience that Toronto has had. Uh, most of the time when I'm talking with people it's, it's about big cities and uh, the likes of Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, New York City, Portland, places like that. Um, so this is a bit different. I mean, my peers are, are mostly those uh, thought leaders in, from those cities. And so today is a time to, to understand our neighbors to the north. And so I've tried to put together a presentation that I think may be helpful. Uh, we're being fo I'm being followed by Julie Cayley and uh, She's uh, with an organization that is the sort of, of group that uh, potentially could be harnessed to, to do some good work. And uh, so the theme of my presentation is uh, climate resilience of municipalities. And I'm looking at matters of infrastructure, and in particular, how those infrastructure systems connect, and how if one fails, other things happen. I'm going to give you some thoughts on what you might do, okay? Uh, I've researched some of the uh, funding opportunities that, that could be available. I've researched some of the regulations that apply. And I'll be kind of bold today. I usually am. And I'm lucky. I don't, I don't get that muzzled by my government. Um, Don experienced that. Maybe he'll share that later. I asked him if he wouldn't mind. He said he wouldn't mind. He's not getting paid by them anymore. So, um, But uh, when my boss said it was good for me to be here, uh, it was in part a neighborly effort. And uh, we're all in this together. And today is a really big day in the history of the climate movement. And I think if when you go home tonight, there should be a lot of news coverage about the climate strike. And at least in Toronto, there's a, there's a big buzz 
about what's going on. And uh, so we're in a moment. We really are. And the people that work in my group, yeah, we all do climate stuff. And I'm lucky I have a group. Like, th there's people that get up in the morning, we're paid, we have a group. Okay, well, there's so many municipalities, they don't have that. Okay, so um, in that respect, uh, we do have some good leadership. And I'm really delighted to say that our mayor is, uh, that's John Tory. He is uh, really showing a strong interest in this. And uh, I was influential in helping him decide that he would go to London uh, prior to going to Copenhagen. And he'll be in London on, on October 7th and 8th. And a lot of the discussions are in the area of climate sustainable finance. Speaking with some of the thought leaders there in London, um, they see dealing with climate as a way of actually uh, making uh, some money because there's a lot of people that need to deal with this. So in that sense, it's an opportunity. After that, he's going on to Copenhagen for the C40 Summit of Mayors on Climate Change. C40 is an organization that I'm work, I work with a lot and that is 40 cities that started as 40 cities. It's now about 88 and these are cities that are working around the world to combat climate change. So I'm directly working with them and we find that working with others is always a good way to go because we all have similar issues depending on the region we're in but we can also garner political support and also support from people and I'm going to say that that's going to be the biggest theme is how do we work together not duplicate efforts but also how do we work together to change minds okay and um, I like something that Joss said already and she said understand accept and act okay so I'm in my presentation today I want to try to move you through those those phases but just on the infrastructure thing um, so th that gives you a sense of, of where we're at the group I'm with is called the environment and energy division of the city of Toronto and uh, so we have about 75 people that work in those areas you can see energy conservation re reducing emissions to the environment energy security and supply and then what I do is the resilient city component and we're gonna say well what what do we really mean by what's what's resilient and we're gonna talk about infrastructure too uh, so infrastructure is the basic organizational structure for social supports and facilities like buildings roads power supplies needed for the operation of a society or an enterprise and another key thing we're going to hear about is, okay, what's resilience? What, the way I see this, this is a modified um, Rockefeller Foundation uh, definition that I've selectively used. Uh, it's um, capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems to survive and adapt no matter the, the chronic stress or acute shock they experience. Okay, and then it's also the ability to bounce back better. And uh, so Don has already talked about individuals, self-reliance, but it's also self-reliance of a community, okay, working together uh, to help each other out. That's the concept of social cohesion. So thinking about, okay, what do we consider critical infrastructure? Uh, the Ontario government actually forces communities to have, and Don mentioned this, um, it's a hazard identification risk assessment, or HIRA. Every community has to have one. And he says, yeah, you need to have it updated. So a question, excellent one, is it updated? And is it updated according to climate risks? Okay, now I'm gonna give you some very practical tips to uh, deal with your infrastructure providers that may not actually be municipally owned, okay? And so what comes to mind especially is electrical, but we also have a significant reliance on telecom, okay? And then even think about outside the box, food, okay? We buy our food from food stores and there's a supply chain involved. I was instrumental in getting Toronto to be the first place in Canada to have a food system climate risk assessment that we just finished about a year ago. So you can see that there's all of these different uh, 
forms of infrastructure, but I, I want to note that the natural environment provides ecosystem services. And if we don't have that, we don't have an awful lot. Okay, so there's all these human built things. And if any of them screw up, you can have big problems. So like during the blackout uh, of, I guess, was it 2003, there was a big lineups for liquid fuel. Okay, so that's on my radar. I've I haven't gotten an answer yet from our provincial government on do we actually, you know, if the power was out for a week, do we have a way to do this? That's a, that's a, a you know, the kind of thing that we need to think about. So these are all uh, human built systems, but there's another type of human built system and it's social infrastructure. And I have a little bit of a story here. Um, I went to the Perth Agricultural Fair just a couple month, a month ago, uh, west of Ottawa, and there's Jim and his wife, okay? He's from the Eastern Townships. He's a local hero. And the reason is, is because in 1998, I got chatting with him, and we're in front of the display of all the different food preserves, okay? And he runs the agricultural fair, uh, one of them in the Eastern Townships, and they have a display, and he was checking out the display, how they do it and stuff, and I got talking about about what I do for work and, and about how people in rural areas, I mean, Don, I'll, I'll challenge you. You say, who's gonna get hurt first? And, 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 uh, and uh, is it gonna be the rural people? Or is it gonna be someone that's stuck in a high-rise apartment building with no electricity that maybe doesn't have a lot of friends? Oh, and yeah, and they're 75 years old and they got a bad knee. Oh, and they're on the 24th floor. Oh, and the elevator's not working. Oh, and it's really hot out, actually. And the window open, only opens 10 centimeters. Oh, and the toilet won't flush because there's no water. And the food's rotting in the fridge. Hmm, who's gonna be more resilient? So those are the people that I need to look after, especially. Um, they pay taxes and they pay for my salary. They're paying for me to be here today. Tomorrow I'm on my own time. But um, we're, uh, we need to do stuff to be more ready. And so Jim and his wife, well, during the ice storm, they had a wood stove. And someone else had 24 pounds of bacon. And they cooked it all. And all kinds of people came over and got fed and got warm. Okay? So what we're talking about here is social cohesion. And he's standing there beside a whole bunch of preserved food. And probably people in rural communities are more likely to preserve their own food. Now they may have food in a freezer. And that may not go so well if the electricity goes off, unless you got a generator, right? And so this is the kind of thing you want to think about is like, if someone's put quite a lot of effort or money into that freezer and that electricity could go off, that could be really financially difficult um, if all that was lost. So then you think, okay, well, should I invest in a generator? And what could it power? It better be strong enough. And then let's talk about generators. Okay, there's gas generators. There, and I don't even know if your area has natural gas. Um, if it does, natural gas will have maybe a bit more assured supply because gasoline runs out. And if you let gasoline sit around a long time, it goes bad unless you put preservatives in it. And if you don't keep starting up the generator every once in a while and checking that it works and maintaining the oil and the spark plugs and all that good stuff, it might not even start for you. So these are the sorts of things we think about. And then in collectively, well, if your neighbor's got a generator and you've previously agreed, well, maybe you can share that, but maybe you've got something that they could use. And so in Toronto, and I admit this, we installed two natural gas fireplaces. Now that burns greenhouse gases, so that's not good, but we don't turn it on very much. But what I mostly bought it for is if the power goes off. And I know that I will become a resilience hub for my neighborhood. And even if the water shuts off, I've got water filtration system that I can run, so I can take water right out of the creek and drink it. And we've got quite a lot of food. We've got winter sleeping bags. And I'm going to be taking in some of the elderly um, widows that live in my neighborhood. They're going to come to my house. And so that's the sort of thing that Jim did and his wife. 
they helped out a bunch of neighbors. And so that's a, that's a piece that I think is important, is knowing who's out there, who might need help, who's on an oxygen concentrator, have they got plans, and if they don't have plans, work with them to get a plan. So, speaking of plans, uh, these are some plans that have occurred. Uh, basically, Toronto's been working on this stuff on climate since 2007. The most recent one is Toronto's resilience strategy, and I was instrumental in getting um, the money from Rockefeller Foundation to, uh, to establish that plan, which is heavy on climate uh, components. So this is the modeling that's been done uh, for the city of Toronto. And just to give you a little bit of a sense, I mean, it, it did cost money. It was about $275,000. It was the first time a city had ever done climate modeling. And we felt we needed to do this detailed modeling because it wasn't being done at a detailed scale. Now it, it more or less is. But the fellow that, the staff member, my friend, my colleague, effectively had a target on his back. And there was a fellow, Rob Ford, that, that identified him as the number one person that ought to be fired first. Okay, now it turns out, I mean, yeah, they were saying, ah, how can you predict the weather? You can't even get the weather forecast right for the next day. What are you talking about for 2040 to 2050? And so this work was done in 2011, and no one, no one was saying, wow, it, you're not gonna get 166 millimeters in a day. Well, you know where it rained? Right over that politician's house. <laughs> that much. And it flooded the whole neighborhood. Okay, and so just to give you a sense, I mean, the hottest that we've ever seen, I mean, it's gone up just a little bit since 2011, but like 37, 38. We're looking at going up to 44 degrees as, as hot temperatures. I mean, that's brutal. You can, if you're ever outside in that, it's like you go to breathe in, it's like, oh God. And typically we get about 20 days in a year where you hit 30 degrees. Well, in the future, it's gonna be more than three times that. So effectively all summer, it's over 30 degrees every day in Toronto. But that's not even counting urban heat island. Urban heat island is where in an urban area, we get up to six degrees hotter. So extended heat waves, this is where you're getting like four days in a row. It's not cooling off at night and it's over 30 degrees. Well, that's happening about once every two years. Well, it's gonna happen two and a half times per year in the future. So that's, this is 16 centimeters of rain in, in a day. Okay, now a day is not so bad because it would be spread out, but the problem is when you get it in an hour or two and you get about that much rain, that's the real problem for us in an urban area. And we're gonna be talking about culverts, the relevance in rural areas. Those are a very important but simple piece of infrastructure that can wash out and that, start, that could cause havoc. And uh, Engineers Canada has identified that as one of, the, one of the top simple big issues is culvert washouts. So we'll talk about that a little later. Now, I'm gonna just plant an idea here and we're gonna use this for a discussion later on. And, and that is uh, a near north climate resilience collaborative. And the purpose would be to convene and catalyze major players on extreme weather impacts and infrastructure and services. Okay, and if you wanted, you could also get into the area of greenhouse gas reduction. So the scope of my talk today really is only on the side of adaptation and resilience, and that is not to downplay the critical importance of reducing our greenhouse gases. Okay, so there's, there's all kinds of people in my office that specialize in that. I specialize in the, in the resilient side of things, and there are many actions that can actually support both. Okay, but today is the, the focus is on the resilience side with me. And so under this idea, municipalities, insurance, electricity, telecom, water management, emergency services, NGOs, and maybe academia would work together. Okay, just, I want to plant that thought in your mind on how people would work together to avoid duplication of effort. I've studied this across the U.S., and they do this. 
they do clusters of cities, okay, it's, it's not so much rural, but it's, we're extending the concept to a rural situation, and they work together. And one of the things they do is when they work together, they say, all right, what's our position in solidarity, and how do we approach the senior level of government together so it gets harder to ignore, okay? So that's, that's a, fur a further thought for you. Okay, so, I mean, Don gave you a way longer list. He's, he's a much more scary guy than I am. But yeah, there's plenty of, of hazards. Um, but I want to just extend this. Like, there, yeah, there's other risks too. Cyber attack, labor disruption, pandemic, chemical release, like some kind of big spill on the highway that gets into the Magnetowan River or something like that. So an enterprise risk approach would be preferable. So I'm just saying this because you want to see climate in the context of all the other risks, okay? I try not to get up in the morning, whoops. Um, I try not to get up in the morning only with blinders on. I try to have a, a wider perspective and say, okay, this is my specialty area, but how does it fit with the rest of all the priorities like affordability, like housing and all that, okay? And what I will submit to you is that climate is a blanket that goes over all of it and has impacts on all of it, okay? It's, it's such a ubiquitously affecting situation. So I do have direct experience and did lead this, the first in Canada, a multi-sectoral group. We call it the Wes Weatherwise Partnership. Don was involved in this and Heather was involved with it and we had the membership very extensive of all of these different groups. And yeah, it was big, and yeah, it represented hundreds of billions of dollars of investment and economic activity. So it was, I mean, it's a different scale, okay? So we're talking about you doing something at a different scale, but the same kind of concept. And it worked. And you know what worked the best? I brought in people that knew what they were talking about. I had six different speakers talked about key systems where we thought things could fail. We said the banking system, health care, buildings, transportation, telecom, and electricity. Okay, and we got them all, I got people that I thought I could trust that would say, okay, what's the best knowledge on how these things could fail? Then we had a vote, and there were 60 different organizations representing hundreds of billions of dollars of built assets, and we said, where is the most likely problem to occur? Because the deal is, where the vote goes, I will spend 50% of my time, and I will convene that sector. So we had a vote, it was pretty exciting for me, because I was gonna find out what my job was gonna be right then. I mean, it was innovative and bold, my boss went along with it, and the vote was almost unanimous on electricity. And Don has already said that, so much hinges on electricity, right? So that was, that was an experience that we had. And um, so I, a little later, I've got some thoughts for you on electrical sector. Um, I've got a few slides now that talk about infrastructure that we would find in, in this area. So here's a culvert, not in good shape, okay? This is a, a big culvert, and it's like more than three meters across, and it, lets water through and way up, like six or seven stories up, there's a road, <laughs> okay? And if this culvert collapses, you're gonna impound a whole bunch of water and eventually it'll break and it's gonna be all hell's gonna break loose and there could be a giant flood downstream and people could die, okay? So we actually located this on one of the projects that I was doing. So here's a culvert that washed out. Heather and Don didn't even blink. They've seen this slide so many times. They're going, oh my God, it's that slide again. Um, this is the Finch Avenue collapse. It took 14 months to fix. Now, this illustrates the concept of interdependencies. It was one tube, okay, the culvert, that was in bad condition. It plugged, it got overwhelmed, there was a big rain, and this happened. But look at all the infrastructure that was affected. And look how scary this is. Two high-pressure gas mains are 16 inches wide? Imagine if they'd cracked open. 
Now it was raining, so you wouldn't luckily get a spark, but eventually it would stop raining, and what if it broke then? Okay, or pipelines for oil, uh, that kind of thing, right? So culverts are municipal infrastructure, okay? Now up here, an obvious impact is just you wreck your road and you've cut off the way you can drive. Okay, now some areas it may be that's the only road. Okay, or it could be a culvert, backs up, floods, floods some stuff around it. Oh, it just flooded the main electrical transformer. Darn. Okay, so stuff like that could happen. So this is that culvert, that same one, 14 months later and $4 million later, that's it rebuilt, and it's done to, according to, and David will like this, proper fish habitat, so the fish can get up and down, all right, and also animals, if the water's not too high, will walk up and down there, okay, and there's a bypass thing, um, this big, uh, this is a, the bypass, if the, if the water ever did plug, then there's a way, a way for the water to get over the road and then down without wrecking stuff. That's a properly designed major culvert. Okay, now, one of the principles that we have is that you make your stuff last as long as possible. Don and I had a chat about this. People are going to want to spend money if they can spend money because it means that their buddy could get some, a job and fix stuff and, you know, keep going, right? Well, do you really need to, to replace it? Do you really, really do? Or is it, can we make it last? And what do we do to make it last? Well, we all, we paint our houses. We don't just let it go. If you let it go too long and the roof's real bad, yeah, then it leaks, then you got a hell of a mess, okay? So there's, you ask the question, what maintenance do we need to do? I'm sure you're, this is warming your heart, right? That's, you got a big job, <laughs> that's a big camp over there. Um, but yeah, so the whole question of when does it need to be done? But then when you do it, okay, if you're doing a major retrofit, a repair, are you doing it replacing like with like? Or are you thinking, what's the future climate gonna be like? Okay, and so if you've got um, buildings, and I'm, I'm trying to make this close to home, if you've got buildings that are close to the water and you know you've got a lot of wind right there, are you getting wind resistant shingles? Because are they just gonna blow off? Okay, so like I just had to redo my roof, 8,500 bucks. And okay, we went for the more expensive ones that would be a bit more wind resistant. And when I put an addition on my house, I put in extra hurricane straps to hold down the rafters. It's not just toenailed. I did that kind of stuff. Okay, and I put in, yeah, I put in a sump pump, but I put in a battery backup too. But now I have to make sure I maintain that battery because after a time, it'll just get old and won't do any damn good. And I have to get down my hands and knees and I got to check it and make sure it's actually working about every four or five months. So that's the sort of mentality is making stuff last, fixing it if it needs fixing, and thinking about when you retrofit it, you're retrofitting for the future weather. And so this is the whole thing about asset management. I'm going to tell you about the asset management regulation. And this is um, where you can connect with your politicians because municipalities have to do asset management policy, asset management plans, and it has to do with climate. Okay, so other things. Debris clearing under bridges. Um, making sure that the Bridge abutments aren't getting undermined and scoured by, by great big um, runoff events. Uh, that's me. I, I love biking. Um, isn't that incredible? That that's in the uh, that's in the Humber River watershed at uh, Old Mill. Okay, that's how deep the water got in 1954. And that's a little bit of a monument that was put there. I just thought it was so clever. That's how high the water went. And that's why we have conservation authorities that say you can't build in a floodplain. Which brings me to another point. Um, I think, I mean, Julie said there aren't up-to-date flood maps here. Is that, she's going no. Okay, you need that. 
And that might be a first thing to get some help on, because then you know what could be at risk in the event of extreme weather, okay? And you know what could be damaged, okay? So that's, that's, that's got to be on the list. And the insurance sector cares about that, okay? Now, some people would say, well, that's a double-edged sword. What if I find out that my property is in that floodplain? That's going to devalue the most important investment I have. Damn, I don't want those flood maps. I'm only going to live there another five years anyways. Or do you say, okay, what can I do to protect the property? Because someone's going to eventually find out it's in the floodplain anyways. So yeah, uh, freeze, thaw, damage on roads, big deal. Uh, trimming of trees. Uh, we talked about your tree trimming this morning. She, does, she invests in her tree trimming. She's smart. She knows that they could fall and wreck her property. She looks after it. She doesn't wait till some big problem. Um, yeah, and the electrical system getting hit by trees. So that's a question you can have for your electrical utilities. How's your tree trimming going? How's it looking? What are your objectives? There's a concept called level of service in municipal legislation. And that's where a municipality commits, they make a decision, and they say, okay, we're gonna have a certain level of service for plowing of roads, clearing of culverts, um, trimming of trees so they don't fall on people's homes or electrical wires. And you say, well, what is the commitment for tree trimming around electrical wires? And you talk to the municipality and you talk to the electrical utility. And you say, how's it going? And then you look with your own eyes and say, well, does it look like if they were going to fall, would they go on the... Like, what's our situation here? Do we have trees that are not looking healthy? That if in a big wind, yeah, they're going to hit wires. All the damage of ash trees and then falling. Excellent example. Um, everybody know about emerald ash borer? Okay, so that was an invasive species. And um, so the ash dying, they fall on the wires prematurely. That culvert I showed you that was all plugged up, that was mostly ash, exactly. So um, does anyone have a backflow? If you're on a sewer, there was a hand. Okay, so this is a backflow valve. It's not the greatest picture, but if you're on a, a municipal sewer, it stops the sewage from backing up into your basement. Little known fact. 25% um, of these fail because they haven't been maintained. Okay, and it's not that hard to maintain them. Usually they have an access port and wear gloves. Um, I usually put a headlamp when I do my dad's, okay? And you reach down, you unscrew this cap, okay? And there's a flapper, and it's disgusting in there. Okay, you wanna see that the flapper can move, okay? And then you say, you get your, your uh, friend to, okay, I want you to run three taps, fresh water, I want to see it go through. And so you, you flip the flap up and you see that it flaps down, so it's probably going to work when you need it to work. But 25% of them don't work. And what happens is they get stuck shut on the bottom and, 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 the, and the backup still occurs. Or they might accidentally, in a situation of, they actually do deploy, but they get stuck shut. And then you go flushing your toilet and the stuff, and, and, and then it doesn't, the sewage doesn't get out. This is a really timely thing that just happened in my home where downstream of it, it got blocked. So if you think of a storm event, uh, this does its job and shuts. But you're at home thinking you can still flush your toilet or use mm -mm. your toilet. Yes. Okay. Now, but if there's the city pipe is full of water and the valve is shut, yeah, it holds all the water. Right, and which is another reason that if you ever put in a backflow valve, you have to disconnect your downspouts that may be going into your sewer because the water off the roof 
is going to go in there and have nowhere to go and it's going to flood your basement. Okay? So this is, that's just, you've got to think about the implications of doing that kind of installation. Uh, lot grading, uh, my friend in my group, she paid the contractor, they landscaped, they made, they made the, the landscaping have the, the land slope towards her brand new basement window and it flooded her basement. So she had to get that fixed. So um, I know that uh, people are concerned about uh, erosion on the Great Lakes and Toronto and Region Conservation Authority has had huge success by putting in what they call groins, these things here, and they've stopped the erosion. And when I visited there a couple years ago, they had a before and after picture. You can see there's lots of vegetation on that slope. Well, before, there wasn't. It was just all dirt, right? So there's stuff that can be done to, uh, to engineer uh, solutions. Are those like going into the water? Like rocks? Well, it's just rock. Yeah, piles of rock that have a certain shape to them. Yeah. So they attenuate the wave action. And then they would have to also take into account, yeah, but what if the water level gets higher? Which it did. Okay, so you need to plan in advance for what, what might occur. Okay, so I, t I said I was going to talk about the asset management regulation. Is any, who's heard of that? You put up your hand. Okay, we got a few. Good, good. Uh, so every municipality should prepare an asset management plan in respect of its core municipal assets by July 2021 and in respect of all its other municipal uh, 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 infrastructure assets by 2023. So there must be a core definition and then other, okay? There's a website, you can look it up. Um, I'm making these slides available and I've given more detail um, sort of in the additional slides. I just, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but um, this is the core piece that has to do with climate, okay? It's a bit wishy-washy, but it gives you some ideas and questions to ask your elected officials, because they have to do an asset management plan. Okay, I'm giving, I'm giving people ammunition here, basically. Um, so, sorry for all the fine print. This is my finest print slide, I promise. Um, every municipality shall prepare a strategic asset management policy that includes the following. The municipality's commitment to consider. Commitment, consider. Okay, I'm going to consider it. All right, five seconds go by. I finished considering it. So it's a bit wishy-washy, but uh, it does give some thoughts, okay? The actions that may be required to address the vulnerabilities that may be caused by climate change to municipalities, infrastructure, assets, and respective matters such as increased maintenance, levels of service. Okay, remember I talked about the level of service commitment? Okay, in municipal legislation, I, I started to talk about that. Council decides they're gonna have a level of service, like road maintenance, like salting and sanding, and how quickly you're gonna get out there so people don't get in accidents, and then so you don't get sued, and you can prove, yeah, we got out there uh, within three hours, we salted it when it was icy. Or, oh, no, uh, our guy was off that day, and uh, we didn't do it, so we get sued. Okay? Or, no, we didn't trim the trees for the last 15 years because our budget was thin. Yeah, but your tree just crushed my house. It was your tree. Oh, so then they get to sue. But if they can prove, oh, yeah, we, were tri we trimmed that three years ago. Here's the records. That we committed to our level of service. We delivered. You can't sue us. Okay? So there's, there's that concept in uh, municipal legislation for what um, municipal decision makers need to do. May I also say that as a city staff member, and as, if there is a staff working on, for a municipality, and they're told, okay, you gotta do the level of service. And so they go and try to do the level of service. They realize, my God, there's no way we can keep up with this. Climate change has made it way worse. We can't do this. This is terrible. Oh, well, I'll try my best. I'll try my best. I'll try my best. And they don't say anything. They don't mention it to the councillors. And they screw up because they don't have enough resources. Well, that's on the staff member. The senior staff member should have put up their hand and said, we can't do this anymore. S situations have changed. And they tell the decision makers and they say, well, can we still commit to this level of service? Is this reasonable? Is this due diligence? What are other municipalities doing? 
Okay, so the, this is what we consider due diligence, and it's, this is what we think about in terms of, of liability under municipal legislation. So this uh, asset management policy has to think about anticipated costs due to climate. Um, what are the adaptation opportunities? Okay, maybe there's some good things um, that may be undertaken. Uh, but then also it talks about mitigation approaches to climate change, meaning how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and then also disaster planning. Okay, so this is, in, this is a commitment to consider. All right, so I guess what I would want to do is ask my elected officials, okay, what's happening on this? How can we work together with other municipalities and instead of writing up our own plan and starting from scratch, could we share a plan? Can we find out what the best practices are in this region and then work together and say, okay, we think this is duly diligent. This is sufficient. This is not over the top. This is appropriate. This is reasonable, okay? And then if there was ever a liability situation, you could say, well, these seven municipalities, we actually considered this. And balancing out of all of our risks and all of our costs and all of our revenues, we thought that this approach was reasonable. And we considered it closely. It wasn't just one municipality rural, it was seven altogether. Okay? So that's, that's a thought for you. So I mentioned this thing about interdependencies. So my objective is to have you understand concept of resilience, interdependencies, and cascade failure. That's like domino failure. Okay, one thing goes wrong, next thing goes wrong. How municipality can and must work with multiple sectors to manage climate risks and help your municipality be more resilient to climate change. So I, I'm involved with C40. Okay, that's 40 cities working around the world. So I bugged the heck out of, out of the management staff there about this. And so they came up with a bit of money and help do a benchmarking study around the world. I said, I need graphics to explain this to people. Okay, so we take example, extreme precipitation. We say, well, which sectors could that affect? Oh, solid, so you follow the gray line. Solid waste, telecom, wastewater, transportation, water, energy, and food. Oh, okay. I mean, you, so you can see that these different things will, now drought only affects food, energy, and water. It didn't affect solid waste or telecom, right? So it's just simple concept. But then the interdependencies, we look at, for instance, <coughs> if you're gonna have food, you're gonna need some energy happening. If you're gonna process solid waste, you probably need some energy happening. If you're gonna have tr treat water, you're gonna need energy. If you're gonna have transportation, you're gonna need some energy. So if you're gonna need to have telecom, you'll need energy. This is the real thing for the City of Toronto and what we look for is concentrations of dependency. Okay, So for Toronto, high dependency on Toronto Water, Toronto Hydro, Telecom and Transportation Services. So that would tell me, okay, those are the ones that I might want to spend a bit more time on. The ones that, that are most affected by extreme weather that most depend upon. So here's another way of looking at it. This is uh, looking at just energy, electricity. So you got extreme precipitation, extreme heat, drought, any of those could affect energy and they'll affect any of those and eventually you are going to get public health consequences, environmental contamination, commuters and freight destruction and economic consequences. Okay, so this is just, this is this the general thing that you can understand. One thing leads to another, leads to another that causes a problem. And so what I'm getting at is that you need to be working across multiple sectors and you need to figure out where your weak spot is. And you may know your weak spots by asking some questions. And here are some questions that I put together just for you. We call it hydro none to begin with. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, how did I come up with these questions? Well, I used to be um, one of the busiest environmental auditors for the electrical utilities 
and I worked for six utilities across Canada. And then I established Toronto's WeatherWise partnership, and they had that vote, and they said focus on electricity. So for two years, I coordinated climate adaptation work for, the, for Toronto. And that was with Toronto Hydro, Hydro One, Ontario Power Generation, IESO, and at the time, Ontario Power Authority, and the Ministry of Energy. And I, would, I brought them together. And when I said, I want to have a meeting, some of them didn't even have anyone to send because they didn't have anyone assigned to climate change. So they did assign someone, and that was cool. Like for the first time ever, some of these organizations assign someone, okay, you're gonna be in charge of climate stuff, okay? And you go to this meeting, let us know how it goes. And so we ran a climate risk assessment for Toronto Hydro, and some of the people, those six that worked with me, they went on to do stuff with the Canadian Electricity Association, and one of them now is a consultant for them. So I called them up yesterday, I said, Todd, how's it going on that? I want to figure out some questions that, that people in a rural municipality can ask. And he coached me. I came up with these questions. And it's okay. Like a municipal councillor could actually call up an electrical utility for the area and ask these sorts of things. Are they a member of the Canadian Electricity Association? If not, why not? Chances are they are. I know Hydro One is. So ask the extent they're following the Canadian Electricity Association guidance for climate adaptation. Are they developing a climate adaptation plan? Now here, this is though where I'm, there's some, I'm gonna say, it's not all just a one-way street, okay? And that's the interdependency thing. And, then the, and this is where, this is the collaborative thing, not challenging but collaboratively saying, are there municipal assets of concern to their operations, like roads or bridges that are at risk of being washed out, and it's the only way to access a certain area, and if that area has a power outage, they can't even get their trucks and crews in? Is there a culvert that the municipality owns, and it's at risk of plug plugging, and if it plugs, the transformer is going to flood, and it's going to be a real bad thing for a lot of people. Okay, so it's, in some cases it may be dual responsibility to take action to protect. Now here's one that really helped in Toronto, and say, have you got a map that shows where your most frequent outages are, and where you've got vulnerable populations? That was a real clincher for me, when we were able to put that together. It took a lot of work in our situation, but it's a good question to ask, and then this thing, this is a, a lot of work was done on, on with Engineers Canada, and it's the Engineering Vulnerability Assessment. There's a website. I was instrumental in having Toronto Hydro do a climate risk assessment, and for the first time ever, I said, let's have a map, and let's show where the worst risks are under about 10 different types of extreme weather. That was an, and Heather was totally involved with that. She provided the, the weather information, her company, and it's, it's leading edge stuff. I'm gonna say to start, the electrical utilities should at least look at that and get some ideas off of it, okay? Um, it's kind of a big deal to do that kind of work, but important, okay? And the Canadian Electricity Association, I found out yesterday, I thought it was gonna be mandatory, and my friend thought so too, but they changed it to aspirational goal. Um, to have a climate adaptation plan. Now, all the CEOs that are on the board of the Canadian Electricity Association, they said, yeah, we gotta do this, and eh, now we gotta do this, but finally the CEA said, yeah, but we don't have any teeth, so we just have to make it aspirational. But what if customers said, we really need this, we really want this, and we wanna work with you? What if they said that? Well, maybe it would get higher on the agenda. So I put this in red at the bottom. Risk information like that may inform future rate applications by your utility. Now, what is the real case is that utilities can only spend money if the Ontario Electrical Board uh, says that they can. And it's all based on they approve what electricity rates people pay. And nobody wants to pay more electricity. 
they don't want to pay for more electricity. But yeah, okay, well, what if we have conservation measures? I mean, people really don't want their electricity going out either, because that causes havoc. So it's a case of balancing the risk, and it's a case of always continuing to, ma to uh, maintain your system so that it doesn't fall into a case of disrepair that gets super expensive to fix. <coughs> so back to this idea. Um, Near North Climate Resilience Collaborative, convene and catalyze major players, possible membership, different groups, and I'm going to wrap up soon. Here's some activities. Flood maps, vulnerability assessment to identify assets at risk, funding applications, and I've got information on that, and working to improve the weak links. Okay, so that's a group of people I worked with. Um, I want to mention quickly, there is online a resource called Building Adaptive and Resilient Communities, or BART. It's run by ICLE, which is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. It's free. They will do consulting, um, $8,000 per community, per, per municipality. Uh, they are used to doing stuff with cohorts like groups of municipalities, because it goes faster and easier, and they do it together. So here's some examples um, of things they've done. They have done stuff in Northern Ontario. Uh, here's the list of funding sources. I won't bore, bore you with actually trying to read them all. You, you'll have that, and you can look them up, okay? And uh, we have an extreme weather portal. You can take a look at that, and, and it's just advice to, to residents. And that's it.